great air raids of yesterday and last night, only a few hours past, it is reported this morning that German bombers and flighting planes are again over southeast British coastal towns. I'm not good at getting up early. Really early. I mean, and even in summer, the really early morning air at 4am is chilly. But this has compensations. For after you've overcome the revulsion of getting out of a warm bed, there is something exhilarating and thrilling at that hour of the morning, especially when there is the prospect of a flying trip ahead. As a rule, it's a good thing to have a cup of tea or something hot and a biscuit. It helps towards waking you up. That was written for Over To You, a series of broadcasts by the RAF during the Second World War. What our man needed was a fine cup of chocks away from tactical tea. Chocks away is a white tea, decent in a dogfight and rising above the rest through adversity to the stars. Tactical tea offer a wide variety of teas, white, black, fruit and herbal. To order your supply, head over to tactical.tea.uk and use the code WW2podcast for 10% off your order. Tactical Tea, waging war on bad brews. Hello and welcome to the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. When we think of the Allied war effort, it is all too easy to overlook some of the junior partners. In this episode, we're going to be looking at Mexico's commitment to the Second World War. The Mexican Expeditionary Force would serve in the Philippines as the 201st Fighter Squadron, known as the Aztec Eagles. I'm joined by now regular of the podcast, Walter Zapatachny, whose new book is The Aztec Eagles, The Forgotten Allies of the Second World War. But before we kick off, just a quick reminder... This podcast is brought to you by the small donations from listeners like yourself. A dollar or two every month from each of you goes a long way to helping me find the time to put the show together. The band of loyal listeners do not go unrewarded. Now, for instance, I was able to make available last year to patrons of the show an extra 27 minutes of Robert Trigg and I discussing issues around Operation Barbarossa. So to find out more, go to patreon.com forward slash WW2 podcast. And it's a big thank you to those of you who already support the show with a small contribution each month. It really is appreciated. Walter, uh, welcome back. It's nice to chat with you uh, again. Where did Mexico politically stand in 1939 when the war broke out? Um, Was Mexico close to Germany? I guess it must be remembered that during the the First World War, Germany tried to woo Mexico into joining the, joining the Central Powers. We, we have the whole um, Zimmerman telegram debacle. Well, I don't think they, were, they weren't close to them. There were uh, many Mexican citizens who uh, wanted to side on the side of the Axis, want, so many who didn't. But sending men to fight with the United States was an unpopular move among many Mexican politicians and, and citizens before the war. You know, the memory of the 1848 Treaty of Guadalupe was still fresh in many minds. The Zimmerman telegram, as you pointed out, that further exasperated the uh, relations between Mexico and the United States. Mexico uh, did not seem to have any interest in the war's European origins, or would um, the accession of Japanese dominance in the Pacific uh, have any particular harm uh, to Mexico as they saw it. However, I think when we look at the close cooperation, economic cooperation between the United States and Mexico, it really meant that in the eyes of the enemies of the United States, the two were indistinguishable. I mean, I don't, I don't know that they really looked at the United States and Mexico, to some extent, even Central America, some parts of it as separate. They were all part of this Western thing, you know. So worried by the, the potential of an unstable government in Mexico, the states began to provide open uh, and secret aid to the Mexican government. Some um, economic cooperation between the U.S. and Mexico resulted when uh, the U.S. purchased silver from Mexico and they granted um, U.S. government-backed loans. But what really it boiled down to was the blunder, two blunders that uh, Germany uh, made uh, that swung the public opinion in favor of, of Siding with the Allies. 
when the German submarine U-564 torpedoed and sank the uh, Mexican oil tanker, and then on on uh, May 14th, 1942, and then U-106 sank another ship on the 21st, that really took the Mexicans by surprise. You know, of course, from the Germans' perspective, you know, it's an oil tanker uh, filled with uh, product that's going to uh, help uh, the Allies. So, you know, they, they didn't distinguish. Mexico asked uh, Germany to compensate them for the losses. Germany refused. And then on the 26th, 22nd of May, 42, Mexico declared war. Were they Mexican flagged ships then that went down or were they just carrying Mexican fuel? They were Mexican flagged ships, yes. Were they heading to the US or heading to the UK? They were heading to the US with oil. Mexico Mexico provided quite a bit of oil to the United States. But weren't there, there wasn't there some contention over Mexican oil? They'd nationalized the oil, hadn't they, from American companies? They, they did nationalize the uh, oil industry because uh, American companies were basically taking the oil, paying the workers very little, and Mexico really didn't think they were getting anything out of the deal. So they, they nationalized the oil industry. And that, that caused a major problem between the United States um, and Mexico during the time because um, there were Mexican, there were U.S. companies, of course, that were processing the oil, you know. Uh, but it resolved itself, if you will, with the war. <laughs> well, it's because it's not it's not something that's necessarily going to tie the two countries together, is it? That was that was uh, the, my, my line of my line of thought. It's not as if they were they were uh, directly politically close, uh, Mexico and uh, and America. So if we look at if we look at the Mexican um, military, you know, during the interwar years, most countries preferred not to spend any money on the uh, military until the close of the 30s, where it's almost in panic, when people start rearming. Uh, what are the Mexicans doing in the interwar years? Are they spending a lot of money on the military? Uh, in, in 1920, there was about 80,000 Mexicans under arms. There were factions within the organization that were loyal to uh, some leaders and others were loyal to others. The numbers changed over the years as leaders, new presidents came on board. They really never became a comprehensive fighting force that could, let's say, fight overseas. Uh, they were involved in local conflicts, putting down revolts and, and local affairs. The Air Force, there really wasn't. The Air Force was, an, I guess it was an Air Force, if you will, but they were involved more in mapping and reconnaissance and those types of things and air shows. You know, They didn't spend a lot of money on uh, on the army per se, and uh, of course the the aviation portion of it. A lot of the pilots that flew in that infancy, infant air force, if you will, had been trained in the United States. They got their flight training there, and they came back. And that's just the way they did it. wasn't any motive for it necessarily. But there were good instructors in the United States, and there were a lot more instructors. So, but so they didn't spend a lot of money, and it was a very small force, and you know war came and uh, they started to realize, hmm, you know, uh, what's going to happen here? Is Japan going to invade Mexico to get the United States? You know, is Germany going to do that? You know, so the political discussion started and, you know, it was kind of a got us down the road, got them down the road to, you know, where they are. And, of course, um, Roosevelt was keen to bring Mexico into the war. You know, when he came in, he tried to implement uh, what he called that good neighbor policy. You know, he wanted to solidify the uh, inter-American um, alliance against the fascists. You know, when World War II started, the, the, the U.S. desperately needed Mexico's cooperation. They needed the oil and they were going to do whatever it took to do that. Uh, I, there was some discussion even in the United States that if necessary, they would have to invade Mexico to capture the oil. To um, to supply the you know the the war effort. But if the Mexicans come in on the into the war on the side of the Allies, did they even need to send any contingent to fight? I mean, they they commit to sending an air contingent, which considering they don't really have an air they don't really have an air force at this period, you'd have thought they might have sent some military. Why do they feel the need to send anything? The, the main the main thing, uh, of course, that changed the political dialogue was the German submarine attacks, sinkings of those two ships. And then as more and more people looked at that, politicians and even the citizens, they began to think, well, you know, um, we're, we're probably not going to be able to stay out of this conflict. 
So we, we know we need to get involved somehow. So how is that going to be? That's what that discussion started to, to take. Uh, that, that road that discussion started to take. So why do they send the Air Force if they don't really have an Air Force, you know, as a, an organization? Well, they, don't, they didn't have an army. And President Cardenas knew that the, he was a Mexican uh, army general. You know, he knew that, um, a, a Camacho rather, uh, he knew that um, the army could never be ready in time. There just wasn't enough people. There wasn't enough funds. And there really wasn't the desire on the part of the United States to bring up a full-blown Mexican army just south of their border. Okay, But he believed that the Air Force could have been brought up. And uh, with the help of the United States, with more modern planes and training, they could participate in the war. Uh, they were small. They were un, un, you know, underfunded. They had no indigenous um, aircraft industry at the time, but they felt he felt that that was the best course to take. And with the United States help, they could participate and contribute to some extent in the war. So how do you recruit an Air Force when you've not really got a, a, you know, an existing Air Force program, as it were? Camacho was confident that he could supply troops to the Allied cause. So he lobbied for military and public support. Uh, knowing full well that the Air Force would be much smaller. Uh, he would go around, give speeches to graduating classes, uh, specifically at the Mexican National uh, Military Academy. Uh, he would speak at luncheons, and he provided a lot of information that um, many of the newspapers printed, as well as the New York Times uh, printed about Mexicans needed to fight abroad. They were, they were ready to go. Uh, so there were a lot of volunteers that were eager to eager to serve in what was termed as this um, elite force that was being put together. So come and uh, be part of this elite group. You know? And it was, certainly. Uh, they selected about 300 to serve in the squadron. Uh, the group included uh, 36 pilots, the remainder of ground forces, uh, ground personnel listed in an officer. And uh, about two, the thing that was, that I'd mentioned before, which was, I think, added to this whole um, idea of willingness to serve is that about two thirds of the pilots that eventually ended up as part of the squadron had received flight training in the United States. So they were familiar with the United States kind of way of flying and a way of doing things. And uh, there were uh, volunteers from all areas of Mexico from the north to the south, the both coasts, um, very eager to join. And it was kind of like, a, you know, let's do this. This is our, this is a national pride is at stake here. And we need to be part of this. So they're trained in the U.S. How are they received in the U.S. training skills? How does the training go? Because if you're coming from no, nowhere, it must be quite hard to, 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 are they just literally copying the whole lot of the American training system, the doctrine, the you know, everything? Essentially adopted into the US Air Force. Well, the the the, the three hundred men and approximately that I mentioned entered uh, the US at Laredo, Texas on uh, July twenty fifth, forty four, and uh, of course they were the first uh, Mexican military organization to ever leave the country with a war mission. So it was a big deal, big send off. You know, a lot of speeches. The families were there. There's pictures of uh, women um, giving flowers through the windows of the trains as they're going north. And I think the decision was made uh, to send them to Randolph Field in San Antonio uh, initially was more motivated by the geographical proximity to Mexico and, and possibly the presence of a lot of Spanish speaking personnel. However, it was also uh, they were also immediately exposed to the institutional racism that was taking place in American society at the time. Uh, they were subjected to the same bigotry and segregation as black Americans. When they rolled into Major's Army Airfield in Greenville, Texas, one of the first tasks undertaken by the American liaison officers was to convince the lower local store owners to take the signs down that they had placed that said, no Mexicans, no dogs. And they had banners made up and strung across the streets with those that saying. Not that prejudice ended at the base perimeter. Uh, you know, every... Uh, very few instructors were interested in training the Mexican pilots and those that were allegedly bilingual. They only provided rudimentary skills. 
uh, information in practice, which is really interesting. And I had never realized this until I started researching this, that the pilots receive much of their instruction from the women's air service pilots or WASPs. Yeah. The squadrons divided uh, according to specialties and went to different training centers. The largest went to Idaho at the Republican Aviation Corporation and uh, Farmingdale. They went to Long Island, New York. Others went to Boca Raton, Florida, which, by, by the way, is where my father started his basic training. Uh, Scott Field in Illinois and so on. And then uh, after their individual specialty training was completed, they all came back to Texas to form as a unit. Interestingly, they were nicknamed at that point when they came back together, the Aztec Eagles. So we wonder, well, how did they come up with that name? The Mexican press named them after this elite Aztec warrior, the elite Aztec warriors of Mexico's history. You know, the Eagle Warriors or Eagle Knights, uh, this elite group. So it all falls into this idea of, uh, of an elite organization um, bringing up the, uh, the status of the organization in the eyes of the Mexican people. Uh, you know, we're out there, um, you know, Mexico's, Mexico's first group to ever leave the country, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They were very, very proud. They uh, pushed through the racism. They pushed through the lack of comprehensive uh, flight training that American pilots would have gotten and still passed the tests, enabling them in the new P-47 Thunderbolt to be able to go fly combat missions. Were they all expect? I presume they were all expected to speak English. Yes, that's correct, and they did. Some of the ground crew had difficulty, but the pilots spoke English. Some not as good as others, of course, but enough to. I mean, English is the international flight language. It was then too. So um, you know, they they knew that, and they, they spoke enough. That they certainly could fly. They shipped to the Philippines, don't they? But they are they essentially. Uh, 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 just a unit in the American army that happened to be Mexican. So they're essentially, you know, they're not under their own command, as it were, command structure. The decision was made to attach them to the 5th Air Force's 58th Fighter Group. And the 201st, which is what they were, 201st Fighter Group, was attached as the, as the 4th Squadron. Although it operated under Mexican command and administration and occupied in its own area uh, in part of the uh, Clark Field in the Philippines. So they were part of the American 5th Air Force. But they had, again, they had their own command and control structure within their own organization. Still, as a, as any fighter group or squadron, they would have to answer to, you know, planning and the administration, up higher administration of the, of the United States Air Force. They get to the Philippines in, it's May 45, isn't it? Which is quite... It really is towards the end of the war. What's the situation like in the Philippines when they arrive? Is, this, is there still much action going on? Uh, throughout June, the campaign to liberate Luzon continued as the U.S. 6th Army fought north uh, toward uh, Kagan uh, Valley, which in this, was in the Central Highlands, where the Japanese 14th Army was holding out in the caves. You know, um, They advanced through rugged terrain passes over valleys, uh, you know, ancient rice tra- paddies, and close air support was, was critical. And as the fighting moved deeper into the mountains, the 201st mission changed from hitting visible targets, to striking hard to see troops in fortified positions um, that were in fairly close proximity to their friendly forces. Fundamentally, the mission of the squadron was carried out in, uh, in basically June 45 and concentrated on strafing and bombing of various targets. And of course, the target uh, selections were done by the Fifth Air Force people, higher level, and those missions came down and uh, to the various squadrons uh, of which the two of first was one, and then they flew those missions. So it's still a very active combat zone. Is there, is there much um, Japanese uh, aviation still flying at that point, or is it all just ground? Uh, there wasn't there wasn't really uh, any Japanese aviation flying at that point. There's ground fire, of course. Um, but uh, the Japanese Air Force was done at that point. What's the Philippines like for, for the men? What are their facilities like? Uh, it's not Clarkville they're flying from. It's it's a subsidiary, isn't it? Well, when they went into, uh, they reached uh, Porek, which was part of the airfield. They began to, it was a separate area, uh, actually opposite from where the rest of the 50th Fighter Group was. They began to set up camp in an area that was kind of separated by some hills and some jungle, stifling heat, incessant mosquitoes, 
Um, they raised tents and built septic tanks, latrines, medical quarters, etc. cetera. Um, you know, the sleeping quarters were rudimentary at best, tents, you know, dirt floors. Um, they, they were able to scrounge up some lumber to put that down on the floors. And because when it rained, it was a big mud hole. Um, water drainage was a problem because it rained a lot in the Philippines. And of course, every man, um, every airman and uh, mechanic had to use mosquito netting to protect themselves. So it wasn't the most pleasant environment, but they, uh, they, they pushed through. How were they viewed by their American com- uh, comrades once they're in the field? Were they just seen as another unit or was there sort of, sort of that institutional racism sort of still bubbling away under the surface? Well, there, there was institutional racism bubbling against the surface. And there was more than just that. There was this, the 58th fighter group had been in combat for a while and they'd flown a lot of combat missions in various places. And there was this feeling that, uh, you know, they're still flying with patched up aircraft and, um, you know, uh, here comes this two of first fighter squadron, Mexican Aztec Eagles with brand new P-47 Thunderbolts. You know, they don't really, they didn't deserve them. They're getting all these accolades about their participation. They're getting the uh, chance to set up a separate area, command themselves, so to speak. So there was some, there was jealousy. You know, there was this, well, it's them. <laughs> you know, they're not part of us. They're Mexican. You know, they can't even speak English right. You know, those, kind, those kinds of things. But they did fly together. I mean, I think what happens, too, in, in, in many units not just this. When it comes right down to executing the mission, I think most forget the ethnicity, the race. We do the mission. And then somehow after the mission is over, it bubbles up again, whatever it is. I've seen that from my own experience in the military. I mean, when it comes right down to flying, I was in aviation for a long time. Um, it didn't matter who you were, you flew, you just did what you needed to do, you know. But then you, you got separate again. I'm not going to drink a beer with you, but I'll fly with you. Kind of thing, you know. I think that was that. That's kind of like it was there. They, they, um, the fifty eighth get posted to Okinawa, but the two hundred first don't. Am I saying am I right? So they don't go uh, on on July twenty fourth. Brigadier General Frederick Freddie H Smith Jr. was the commander of the Fifth Fighter Command, uh, and he recommended that the uh, Aztec Eagles be retained in the Philippines. His opinion: they should. He said they should remain there. Until quote until such time as their operational efficiency was brought to a level to ensure success in combat operations close quote well they had already flown pretty successfully I mean they did a lot of missions but he was prejudiced against them uh, in the minds of many others uh, they were combat ready and they should have gone but his opinion uh, you know was accepted and to this day. Uh, there's a debate on whether it was the decision was racially motivated, whether there was there were some issues about combat efficiency, uh, and we'll probably never know um, whether it was the ideologies between the way Mexico wanted to operate or back to their countries. You know who knows. Um, but and many people uh, respected their flying ability. Apparently, he did not, and he had to fly away. So they fly. 791 sorties which seems like a lot for 26 pilots when you're saying they're not they're not up for it uh they've certainly put in quite a lot of what nearly 3,000 hours of flying yeah 2,842 hours or so uh that's a lot dropped almost 2,000 bombs yeah they, they did a lot in the short period of time that they were there so for smith to to, to propose that they weren't uh combat ready uh, you know i I don't know. My, my my assumption as well is when you talk about uh, uh, the Pacific, uh, that for, for the flyers, the oddity is there's quite a lot of time when they can't fly because the weather's against them. Now it might be that in 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 the time that they were there, the weather was great. And <laughs> but usually when people say, "Well, the clouds wrong, the rain, the da da da," and you can't fly, so to do a lot of missions in in a relatively short period of time it is quite a big thing. I would have thought, but well, it is. And if in in the book I have a. Uh... Each of the missions they flew, a small blurb on what what the missions were about, and you'll note one will note that uh, many of them were called back because of weather uh, or other circumstances. 
Um, but they still flew a lot. How did their performance, so at the end of the war, how did their comport, do we, how does, how does their performance, not comportance, how does their performance compare with their US counterparts? Is it a way of uh, measuring, measuring them up against one another? Uh, I don't, I didn't find the, uh, a direct measurement between the members of the 58th and them. It's probably out there somewhere, but at the time I was writing the book, I didn't find it, but, uh, they, they, they received wide recognition from General MacArthur and others. Uh, he recommended the award of the Legion of Honor to several of the pilots. Um, they did lose some pilots and other members during the conflict and during training. For the same period of time, the missions, um, they carried out more missions than many of the American pilots. And so as many in the American high command looked highly at the Aztec Eagles. Uh, you, you pointed out, it seems like a lot of hours flown. Yeah, it really is. A lot, there's a lot of missions, a lot of uh, activity done in that short period of time that they were there. You know, I can't give you the exact right now. I'm sure it's out there somewhere. But um, suffice it to say that uh, for the amount of time that they were there, they flew a lot. So when they return home, do they come home as heroes? Are they, is it, is it lauded as a big thing, the, the foreign service being part of the war? They were, they came back as national heroes. There were parades, there were activities, uh, just about every town had some type of periodic, uh, some type of patriotic uh, display. Town plazas were, were decorated in red, white, and green banners, which is their colors. I was a Mexican flag. When I retired from the military in 2009, my wife and I moved to Baja, California, Mexico. And I, we went, we visited a lot of these little towns and villages. And some there, I, I saw some monuments, small monuments to the Aztec Eagles. And one of the people we got to Mexican national that we befriended, uh, still friends to this day, uh, once he found out that I was writing and I was an historian, and he said, well, you should write about the Aztec Eagles. I didn't really know what the Aztec Eagles were all about. And he's the one that kind of got me uh, looking at it and, and do it and, and interested in doing the research about it. But to this day, um, you, you can go to towns and they talk about him in the schools, in the high schools. There's stories about the Aztec Eagles. Again, you know, they were promoted as this elite national heroes. Uh, look what they did for Mexico. And, and they did a lot. They helped end the isolation of Mexico. You know, they paved the way for important agreements between the U.S. and Mexico. They helped modernize the Mexican Air Force, and they demonstrated that they could, in fact, mount a successful expeditionary force. There was a school built uh, in their honor, which still teaches kids to this day. There's parades to this day in certain villages from where some of the pilots and other other members came from. Um, So they haven't been forgotten. And um, they certainly helped the Allies defeat Japan. Remarkable that uh, I, for such a small cadre of men to be so well remembered. And it might be just because they are such a small cadre of men that they are so well remembered. Um, and I never thought the diplomatic uh, outcome is probably far bigger than their contribution to the war, being seen to be part of the war for Mexico. Yeah, had, had Mexico uh, decided not to send forces or materiel, uh, and they sent more than just oil, raw materials as well, to the United States to support the war effort and other part, other allies. You know, I wonder uh, what would have happened. Would we have invaded Mexico? <laughs> you know, w- would the Germans have invaded because they now had a southern foot? I, I mean, there's so many questions. Mexican Aztec Eagles probably because of their participation, uh, because of Mexico's willingness to put forth this this effort and provide this force um, never really came to be, you know, I mean, those things didn't come to be. Remarkable. So did they disband after the war or did they become sort of the cadre of a new Mexican air force? The Mexican expeditionary air force was disbanded, which was the group that was put together to administratively, administratively take care of sending the two of first fighter group. The two of first fighter group still active to this day. They fly uh, training aircraft, the 58th Fighter Group, United States 58th Fighter Group, was inactivated after the war. Uh, they've since come back together in fast-moving jets. <laughs> uh, five of the Aztec Eagle pilots became generals. 
Others went on to distinguish careers in aviation, business, academia. Well, presumably, they made great connections during the war, and they probably are the uh, cream of their crop socially. And if they weren't, they certainly would be by the time they re- returned from the war, well-decorated young men. Yes, they were. Uh, Absolutely. Which, which is quite remarkable. Quite remarkable. So, as to Kegels, what's next on the list of uh, on your to-do list? Well, I'm. I also am uh, working on my PhD. And uh, I've completed all of the compulsory exams and so on. So I'm right I'm now into the dissertation writing stage. And what's your, what's your PhD? I'm looking at the motivating factors that caused the members of the 28th Infantry Division to um, fight so strongly to delay the Germans um, during the Battle of the Bulge for those first couple days that eventually enabled the allies to move forces into Bastogne. And so much has been written about it. I've even written about it, as you know, 110th book. Yeah. yeah. Um, But none of us have really examined the reasons why they fought so strongly. You know, uh, there's certainly uh, um, books written about what motivates soldiers in combat, but I have, I was a 28th division historian, as you know, and, and I have access to, many interviews and I've done many interviews myself of World War II veterans. And there's a couple of things that come loud and clear that really haven't been identified in some of the other writings, uh, religious faith, uh, camaraderie, other things. And, and I, I want to investigate that further and to see to what extent those factors motivated them. So that's basically what it's about. That's a fascinating book. Cause you, you've got, uh, there was, there's a book about the British, the, the, the uh, I own and I've not read about morale in the desert and, and, and how that the change in morale just with the change of commanders is, is actually a, a massive contributing factor. And uh, who else was I talking to? I was talking to uh, Robert Forsick who pointed out and it hadn't occurred to me. He said, you know, when you're winning, it's a m- massive uh, ego boost uh, f- for men. You become invincible and you think, well, actually, the, all right, the Germans, have, it's a big counterattack, but actually, until then, they'd been winning <laughs> the Americans and the British in Northwest Europe. I mean, romped across Northwest Europe. Well, well I visited Luxembourg a couple of times and, and worked with some of the, uh, and, and Belgium and Germany, uh, worked with some of the local historians to try to figure out, um, you know, what really happened? Where did it happen? We walked the battlefield, you know, many times and uh, artillery placements on the German side and those types of things. But again, we've never really, never really addressed for sure uh, what those motivating factors were. In many, in many cases, they fought to the last man. They had no ammunition left. Um, and the German uh, uh, generals uh, after the war wrote that um, you know, had, had uh, they not been so successful in delaying them, they would have blown right through Bastogne on Antwerp. And, you know, who knows if they would have captured Antwerp. Um, the war wouldn't have been, we wouldn't have won the, I mean, the, they wouldn't have won the war, but uh, it, it probably would have changed the complexion of it a bit and, and how many months it would have been delayed, how many people would have lost their lives as a result of us losing the Deepwater Port. It's a fascinating question, actually. Why did what motivates? Because in some respects, you know, the Germans and the Russian, what motivates them is often that if, if, if they give in, they'll be shot by their own sides. But the Americans knew full well that they won't be shot by their own people and actually the Germans would accept them uh, Chances are the Germans would accept them as prisoners of war. So there is a get out. So what does motivate them to hang on through grit? And to come up with these unique tactics um, to delay the Germans. I mean, you know, I, I wrote about it some in my 110th book, but it was just one of the regiments. Um, but we're going to look at it all in the dissertation. Well, Walter, I, I, I look forward to reading your thesis once you've finished. Um, we'll get you back for chat. Loyal listener, if you want to know more about the Mexican contribution to the war, Walter's book is Aztec Eagles, the Forgotten Allies of the Second World War. Next time, I think we'll be looking at African-American Medal of Honor winners. So until then, I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening.